Great, so let's go now for the last chapter of the book of Deirdre Carabine, John Scotus Eriogena. And we're going to talk now about the return. We have a quote here from T.S. Eliot. As the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The resolution of diversity. Uh, the reditus, meaning the return, are the means whereby creation will be transformed into God. It signals the end of all division and opposition in the universe. The process of unity is the final great adventure of natura, all things transposed from finitude to infinity, so that God shall be all in all. Division operates in two levels, epistemological and ontological. Every division can be restored to unity. Every outpouring is reciprocated by a converse movement. Very important. God became human so that human might become God. Wow. Effect the return of the whole of natura. Okay, so let's go to number two. There we go. Getting faster with this thing. Okay, so uh, the journey back um, to the uncreated, uncreating. Yeah, this is the first division of natura. This it relates exclusively to God. He takes uh, he takes from other philosophers of early Christianity like Augustine. Epiphan Epiphanius, Ambrose, Gregory, Nazai Nazian Gregory Nazianzus, okay, Gregory of Nyssa, I knew Gregory of Nyssa, we have him here, and Maximus the Confessor and the Pseudo Dionysius. Perhaps the most important one will be the Pseudo Dionysius in terms of the influence that uh, these philosophers had on Eurygena. Uh, but however, Eurygena has his own views and the subject of the reditus is not clear cut and well ordered. It's uh, very rich in scriptural text and their exegesis, allegorical and metaphorical expressions used in the Periphysian 5, so eschat eschatological questions. So we are going to confront here the whole theme of how actually whatever we are hearing of in Genesis takes form in uh, eschatology, in uh, analysis of revelation of the last book of the Bible. So the first and the last book of the Bible will be very much connected for Eurygena. We will be talking about the same thing to the point that only at the end is where Genesis is actually uh, making sense of. Yeah. Eurygena does not take uh, Genesis uh, as a historical real event, but as an al allegorical explaining more where Natura goes more than what its origin is. Although, of course, will relate to the to that end being in the origin. So, final cutting of the circle back to the realm of the uncreated, uncreated must be understood as movement from appearance and speech and knowledge to concealment, silence and unknowing in the hidden darkness of the divine. So in the return, we will also have this aspect of uh, the impossibility of truly knowing the essence of God and the darkness of it, which is actually at the origin of light. There we go. So we're going to turn into number three here. Uh, in the book one of the Periphysium, Eriogena asks a fundamental question. Why should there be a return at all? If things did not return to their source, they would remain worthless. 
because the whole of creation is a manifestation of the image of God that must return to itself. And here's a quote from Pyrifysium number one. While by itself and in itself it is unmutable and eternally at rest, yet it is said to move all things since all things through it and in it subsist and have been brought from not being into being. For by its being all things proceed out of nothing and it draws all things to itself. Since all natural phenomena are, government, are governed by the laws of cycle, the whole of creation will come forth from God, which came forth from God, must return to God. Just as a magnet attracts iron without itself moving, so too the cause of all leads everything back to itself by the power of its beauty. Nature itself is cyclical in many aspects. It also uses the examples of dialectic, arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy to illustrate that the beginning of all things is also the end. Okay, number four, slide number four here. Let's go. In relation to the return of human nature, so we have the return of all creatures of all creation and now we have specifically for the return of human nature again Genesis is going to be very important the return was promised when Adam and Eve were expelled from paradise and the Lord said the man has now become like one of us knowing good and evil he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So there is two, uh, there is some ambiguity in this passage for the part because of the particle ne in Latin. And it could be interpreted in two ways, negatively or interrogatively. Uh, in the negative way will be now therefore let him not stretch forth his hand and take off the tree of life eat and live forever and the interrogatively uh, interrogative version will be may he not perchance put forth his hand and take off the tree of life as an with an interrogation mark so Irigina is going to choose the interrogative interpretation. This means that Irigina is going to argue for the general return of all things to their source through human nature, which gains the image it had lost through the fall. Okay. Here we go again. Number five. Unity that will result when God will be all in all. So we're going to talk about the unity that will result when God will be all in all. We follow here Maximus the Confessor, uh, which uh, talks about the presence of light in air. It's a beautiful image. In the light of the sun, air appears to be nothing but light. But in the presence of God, human nature appears to be nothing but God. Irigina also uses the analogy of iron, which is smelted in fire and becomes liquid. It is by reason alone that it is known as iron, even though it is in a different form. In the return, there is both destruction, because all things are in fact being changed, and preservation, because they retain something of themselves in the ascent. So we have a quote here from the Pyrifism number one again. So the sound intellect, which relates to these two images that we've been talking about in this slide. So the sound intellect must hold that after the end of this world, every nature, whether corporeal or incorporeal, will seem to be only God, while preserving the integrity of its nature, so that even God, who in himself is incomprehensible, 
is after a certain mode comprehended in the creature, while the creature itself by an ineffable miracle is changed into God. So this essential connection between God and the creature is maintained here, given that human nature participates of that center that we were talking about in the first videos of this series. So let's go to the next one, number six. In order to explain the simultaneous process of destruction and preservation in the return, Ryugina once again has recourse to a Neoplatonic analogy. So as a Dionysian evocation. Yeah, so the way from the Neoplatonics to uh, the pseudo Dionysius and then to Eurigena seems to be a, like a direct, direct highway. Yeah? So the unity perceived in the visual and auditory realms, just as many voices make up one choir and many candles make up one light, so too the many parts of creation can be said to make up one creation in God. So we have here this very poetic, all these very poetic images actually are very useful to express something that otherwise to, to talk about in abstract terms could be very difficult indeed. But once we have the image, we can perfectly understand what is meant here. Therefore, while all things will be restored to their principle, each retains individual properties. So it's not just like a mesh that will be done with uh, all creatures that become all one into God, but each and every one will retain in its individual properties. So it will be interesting to say what he will think about if they retain free will and what that means. Yeah, It becomes clear that Origina does not conflict God and creation, even in the final moment towards unity. In fact, the eradication and resolution of all distinction cannot take place on the ontological level as it can perhaps on the epistemological level. Erigena also uses the example of a golden ball set upon the highest pinnacle of a tower. Everyone can see it at the same time and one person's vision does not obstruct the vision of another. Yes, it will be in line with the with the image of the of the light and the air, the iron when it's melted, that we know that is still iron, although it's in a very different form, and also the visual unity of the and the the auditory realms, like when a choir is singing, the harmony that happens is just one sound, although it's composed of many voices. In the procession from God, God became not God yet remained God. This comes down from chapter number four that we, that we saw uh, in previous chapters. In the return, the creature becomes not creature, yet remains creature. God can be seen in the creature, and the creature, which is no longer called by the name of creature, can be seen in God. The changing of human nature into God is not a perishing of substance, but a return to the condition it would have enjoyed, but lost through transgression. Eryugena held the view that individual substances do not perish in resolution, because in the first instance, they were gift, given, and covered with grace. And also remember that in Genesis, that creation, the creation of man, the creation of woman, is something that happens instantly and the fall also happens instantly. So that distinction of human nature being born in the world, which is partly part of the fall but partly not, yeah, it doesn't really manifest as such and it will never lose its essence until the uh, it, it will never lose its essence in the resolution and it will, be not, it will be not resolved as such until the resolution of the coming back into God of all nature. 
So then we preserve the meaning of creation as the image and manifestation of God, which is very important, of course. So number seven. So thirdly, he wanted to reconcile his Neoplatonic and Christian sources on this point. Unity, he wanted to achieve unity without loss of identity, which is specifically Christian, and it will be an adaptation of a Neoplatonic theme. Creation cannot perish, creation cannot perish or be absorbed in the divine nature. Rather, it returns to its primal, pristine state. Some things in human nature are mutable and do perish, but others endure and cannot be destroyed. What is created in human nature, according to nature, will remain intact. What is added as a result of the fall will perish. The end of this life is not death, but the separation from death, actually. In the Periphysium, the return, understood in terms of human nature, is the corollary, corollary movement of the fall from paradise and from angelic status. It is promised in the return. Promised in the return is a sharing in the same status as the celestial essences, the angels, when all corporeality, sexuality, corruption, and modes of generation have been returned to their causes just as it passes all intellect how the word of god descends into man so it passes all reason how man ascends into god again we see this direct correlation between one nature and the other so the pivotal the pivotal point in Origena's understanding of return is the incarnation of the word the word descended in order to redeem the effects of those causes that are present in the word and that are called back to the word. As the conception of the unification of all things is broadly Christological, broadly Christological. So some quotes from Perifism number five, the common end of the whole creation is the word of God. It was to bring human nature back that the incarnate word of God descended, taking it upon himself after it had fallen in order that he might recall it to its former state, healing the wounds of transgressions, sweeping away the shadows of false fantasies. The transformation of human nature into God is effected through the word, who in assuming human nature raised it up. In assuming human nature, the word assumed every creature made in that nature. Therefore, all creation will be called back to its source through the word. So let us remember the connection that exists between the word and God itself and human nature itself. Okay, let's move to the next one. Let us fix this just a little bit. The next one is number 8b, 8b, let it, let's just, okay, here we go. So another quote, um, not only did the word, not only did the word exalt and bring back the humanity which he had received and refashioned in himself to a parity with the angelic nature, but also exalted it above all angels and heavenly powers, above all things that are and all things that are not. All sensible things will return through human nature into their causes in which they exist substantially. I want to call to the attention again of how intrinsic it is for Origina, creation it, itself and human nature and the place that humans play in it. All things were created in human nature. They cannot return except with it. And we have here, when man is recalled into the original grace of his nature, which he abandoned by transgression, 
he will gather again to himself every sensible creature below him through the wonderful might exercised by the divine power in restoring man. Origenes' account of the role of the incarnation of the word as the starting point of the return is instrumental in that it signals the redemption of the fallen. Human nature becomes the locus for the restoration of all created nature. Very good. Let's go to the last one now. I have here. So we're reminded of the Plotinian description of the one calling all things back to itself through love. The ascent is described by Eugenia as the movement of love. Because God is lovable, God's beauty draws all things upward back to their source. He is the cause of all love and is diffused through all things and gathers all things together into one and involves them in himself in an ineffable return and brings to an end in himself the motions of love of the whole creature. The language reminiscent of the Neoplatonists, for the most part, his discussion is concealed. Let me see, this, this, this is not making much sense. So the language reminiscent of the Neoplat so the, lang the language that he's using, using is reminiscent of the Neoplatonists. For the most part, his discussion is concealed with the more technical aspects and details of the eschatological events. So we're going to see through all, all these philosophers, it's all about how much of the Greeks and how much from the Bible is taken and the dialogue between the two. Yeah? And we will have on one extreme, the literal, the, taking the Bible literally and sort of ignoring a more allegorical and Neoplatonic interpretations. Uh, and then we have uh, people who are going to say that uh, actually Christianity comes from the Greeks almost directly. Okay, so we, hopefully we're going to be able to explore this fascinating world. The whole process of division which had reached its completion with the creation of human beings, the crown and perfection of the six days work of creation, is the location for the start of the return through the world. And we finish now 7.1 and I'll see you in the next video.